grace and peace to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Good morning. A couple of announcements as we get started today. Um, we all are still looking for volunteers to be ushers and greeters and to serve coffee fellowship. Uh, the sign-up sheet is out in the narthex, so if you haven't had a chance to do so, please check that. I've got the dates through the end of May out there. Um, so we would appreciate some help in those areas. Also, next Sunday, we've got a couple of things going on. Uh, with it being Mother's Day, we are celebrating our annual Cradle Rock. So if you um, have a child or grandchild that you know that would like uh, to participate in that, please contact Beth Fawcett. Um, also next weekend, uh, we will be taking an offering for Blanket Sunday for the Church World Service um, Blanket Program. So that will be out in the narthex next Sunday morning. Are there any other announcements that I'm forgetting this morning? If not, let's stand as we sing together our centering song, which is Come and Find the Quiet Center, number 2128, or on the screen. Please join with me in our call to worship. God is the true vine. And we are branches. Connected to God. Connected to God. Connected to God. We come to worship God who is the true vine. Amen. Please be seated. Let us join our hearts and our voices together in our opening prayer. God of love, you have invited us to this time and space. We lift our hearts in thanksgiving and joyful praise for the gift of your love. God of life, you have invited us here to place all that we have 
and all that we are in you. Through the power of your Holy Spirit, guide us to not only lift up our hearts in worship, but to offer our hearts in love. Amen. Our psalm reading this morning is Psalm 22, verses 25 through 31. Let's read this responsively. I offer praise in the great congregation because of you. Let all those who are suffering eat and be full. Every part of the earth will remember and come back to the Lord. Because the right to rule belongs to the Lord. He rules all nations. All who are descending to the dust will kneel before him. My being also lives for him. Generations to come will be told about my Lord. They will proclaim God's righteousness to those not yet born. Amen. We have an opportunity now to give back to God as we present our tithes and offerings. Those worshiping from home can present their tithes by mailing those to the church or bringing them to the office, or any of us can set up automated giving through CoinBank. Let us give back to God. Let us pray together as we dedicate our gifts to God. God of the far-flung universe and God who is closer than our own heartbeat, we long to dwell in your closeness, abiding in you and you abiding in us. However, the call to abide in other places is strong, to abide in the world of popularity and acceptance or in the world of increasing wealth and power centered around our own wants and desires. As we offer our gifts and ourselves to you, help us to turn away from other calls and abide in that place of heart's deepest desire in your son, Jesus, and he in us. In Christ we pray, amen. You may be seated. Our next hymn this morning is I Need Thee Every Hour, number 397 or on the screen.
Today we have two scripture readings. The first comes to us from the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. Listen now for the word of God. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. Our second reading comes to us from the book of Acts, chapter 8, verses 26 through 40. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go towards the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home, seated in his chariot. He was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and he heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you understand what you were reading? He replied, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter and like a lamb silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, about whom, may I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus. And as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each and every one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. There was a, uh, a takeoff of the old Looney Tunes cartoons that they brought back in the 90s called Tiny Toon Adventures. Now, I know Virg and I were fans of this one. I don't know if any of you or your kids or grandkids watched this, but they took many of the old classic Looney Tunes characters and reimagined them as children. And one of my favorite episodes features a character named Plucky Duck. And Plucky was sort of a toddler version of Daffy Duck. And in this particular episode, Plucky and his mom were, had to ride in an elevator. And as they walked over to it, Plucky's mom was going to press the button to call the elevator. And Plucky, in all of his toddler glory, wearing his diaper and sucking on his thumb, said, No, you push the button. Me push the button. Not your turn push the button. My turn push the button. pretty accurate description of how toddlers and preschoolers begin to exhibit their independence at about that age. 
They want to do things for themselves. And sometimes they can and things go well. Plunky did manage to push the button, but then he pushed it up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down. Sometimes things don't always go to plan. <laughs> but still, we encourage kids' independence. We value independence in ourselves and in others. Our nation's founding document espouses and reveres the idea of independence. Society values independence at an exceedingly high rate. Schools talk about how, how well students can, can learn and work independently. Job performance is often evaluated on how well someone can work productively, independently, without a lot of supervision. But what does the scriptures say about all of this independence? Are we created by God to do a life of faith on our own? Is our faith just another area of life in which we are expected to be able to care for ourselves and do it all ourselves? The quick and easy answer is no. In John 15, Jesus tells us that when it comes to faith, we are not independent. In fact, we are fully dependent. We are branches on the vine that is Christ. Without the support of the vine, we die. Without the supply of water and nutrients brought to us by the vine, we die. We are dependent on Christ. I love this image of the vine and the branches. Now, I am no vine grower. I am not a gardener or a farmer by any stretch of the imagination. But I have read up a bit on the process of growing grapevines because of this particular scripture. And some of the things that I've learned, I find heighten my understanding of this passage. For instance, vines like to grow in acidic soil that is a bit rocky. Now, what does this tell me about what Jesus has to say in John 15? Well, the vine grower, God, places Jesus in this rough environment, not us. The vine is planted in the midst of the acidic rocky soil. Jesus can draw what we need even out of that inhospitable environment and help us grow and thrive. And when I think about the world and how harsh it can be, how humankind has always found ways to be inhospitable to one another, to be poisonous, to be difficult and hard-headed, boy, I can quickly become disheartened and I want to retreat from the world. But Jesus places himself between us and that harsh environment, pulling out only what is good, what is necessary, what is beneficial from that ground, and brings it to us. When we are rooted in Christ, when we abide in Christ, we are not immersed in the harshness of the world. We are rooted in love. But living in this world doesn't always feel as though we are immersed or surrounded by love. And I find that when I am tired or weary, stressed or sad, I often lose sight of Jesus' love. And my default at those times is to become bitter, cynical, angry, and discouraged. I begin to look around at my neighbors, at our country, at the society, at the world, and I begin to dislike people, distrust people. Characterize those I've never met as bad or evil or selfish. And when I get like that, when I find myself looking at the world with jaded and hateful eyes, I have to ask myself, am I abiding in Christ? Or have I disconnected myself from that vine and rooted myself in the acidic rocky soil? If we look again at John 15, we see that those who do not abide in Christ are thrown away and wither. They're gathered up and burned. And withered is often how I feel when I have allowed myself to become disconnected from Christ. It's as if my very heart shrivels up like the Grinches and becomes three sizes too small. Because there's no love filling it. 
So what is filling my heart? If I am abiding in Christ and being nourished by Christ, my heart should be full of love and grace, righteousness and justice. But if I'm abiding in the world, I'm cut off from that vine and my reserves begin to dwindle quickly. Only when we abide in Christ, feast on God's word, go to God in prayer, submit to God in worship, surround ourselves with other Christ lovers, and walk with Christ every step of the way, will we be able to bring that nourishment of love through us to the world. Now, of course, that all sounds pretty perfect, right? Just stay connected to God and life will be all sunshine and roses. But we know that isn't the way things work, right? We still face struggles. We still have hurts. And so how do we respond when those things happen? Again, I turn to John 15, to what I have learned about vines and vine growing. Do you know when a vine is pruned? The rest of the vine acts and reacts as if the entire vine is dying. The vine knows no difference. Think about that. When, when a vine is being pruned, it thinks it's dying. Now translate that to us. There are events in our lives, there are traumas that we suffer and griefs that we bear, struggles that we endure that can feel as though we are never going to get through them. How often do we hear or think or say, man, this is killing me, or I don't know if I can go on. God is doing something in those moments. This might be the key to growth. Branches are pruned to produce more fruit. And the vines that are producing the most fruit are the ones that get pruned. So what is the fruit? Scriptures say that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace. It is patience, kindness, gentleness. It's goodness and faithfulness and self-control. God is working through whatever you are going through to help you produce more fruit. If you can keep abiding in Christ through whatever you face, fruit will come. Now, I mentioned that pruning happens to those branches that are producing fruit, but we often think about it the other way around, don't we? That it's the ones that aren't producing that get pruned. No, those get cut off completely. Not just pruned, not just trimmed back. the ones that do produce fruit. They want those healthiest of branches to produce more fruit. So even if you feel like you are staying connected to Christ, that you are producing fruit and you're still facing hardship, just know God sees your fruit and knows you can produce more. There's one other thing to keep in mind as we work through this metaphor, and that is we aren't the only branch on the vine. There's lots of other branches. And we also know, if we're extending this metaphor, that there are people who are not branches on the vine. And I think our reading in Acts addresses this. Philip, one of the apostles, a Christian, sees a man reading scripture, but this man is not a Jew. Not only is he a Gentile, he's an Ethiopian. He would be immediately recognizable as someone from a different culture, from a different race. But he's also a eunuch, sexually different, physically different. His face hairless, his body and musculature not developed like a man who had gone through puberty. This man was about as different from Philip as he could be. Everything about how Philip had been raised probably told him to stay away from this guy. This strange foreigner with dark skin and weird features. I try to put myself in Philip's shoes. Who is it that I could see that would feel that strange and different? 
I think each of us could probably conjure up someone. Someone who, through no fault of their own or because anything that they might have done or said, just makes us uncomfortable. Simply because of what they look like, as unfair and judgmental as that is. Would I go to that person to help them understand Scripture? Would I not only go, but as Scripture says Philip did, would I run to them? This person for whom I would maybe normally run away from, would I run to them to share Christ with them? That's what the Spirit called Philip to do, and I believe that's what the Spirit is calling us to do. We must be willing to share Christ with those who don't know him. Our lives must reflect the love and the grace that he has shown us. Sacrificial, humble love. After all, they may not be a branch on the vine yet, but Romans 11 tells us that even though so-called outsiders can be grafted onto the vine by God. But then there's times that even those other branches make us want to turn and run the other way instead of running towards them. Even other faithful disciples of Jesus sometimes make us uncomfortable. Those who, who view things differently than we do, things like full inclusion of LGBTQ persons in the church, those who hold different ideas about heaven and hell, those who see no problem with premarital sex, those who don't believe women should be pastors, those who don't believe that every word of the Bible is literal historical truth, and those who believe that it doesn't matter if anything in the Bible actually happened or not. How do we coexist on the vine with them? Sometimes I wonder, do we want to coexist on the vine with them? So often this world tells us that only the ones who think like us should be let in. But who decides who's us and who's them? Jesus says that all who abide in him are branches on the vine, whether or not they agree with us 100% on everything. So we need to learn to dwell with them those other branches, while we all abide in Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not willing to stop abiding in Christ. So maybe, just maybe, if I allow Christ to keep filling me and those other branches keep allowing Christ to fill them, someday we'll all start to resemble one another more as we begin to resemble Christ more and more. I don't need to change them. I don't need them to change me. We just need to dwell with each other in Christian love, staying connected to the vine and let God do the work of pruning, pruning away anything that doesn't bring life in all of us so that we can all produce the fruit of God's kingdom. May it be so. Amen. What more tangible way do we have of thinking about this idea of abiding in Christ and dwelling with others than when we come around the table? I love that um, our invitation to communion states that Christ invites to the table all who love him and who earnestly repent of their sin and who seek to live in peace with one another. Think about that. Those are the conditions. Do you love Christ? Can you admit that you are a sinner and repent of those sins? And do you want to live in peace with one another? If so, this table's for you. And it doesn't matter if we agree on anything else under the sun. If we can agree on those things, Christ says, come and be fed. Be a part of the vine. Be fed and nourished by the love and grace of God. So Christ our Lord invites you and all to his table those who love him, 
who earnestly repent of their sin and who seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess of our sins before God and each other. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and a joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread. He gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup. Again, he gave thanks to you and gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and a living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and juice of the vine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. All right, peel back your little cellophane first to reveal your wafer. This is the body of Christ given for you.
And this is the blood of Christ poured out for you. Thanks be to God. We'll try to make sure there's a, a garbage uh, trash can at the back. So as you leave, you can drop those um, on your way out the door. But now let us pray together. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As we move into our time of prayer, uh, we have another prayer blanket to bless today um, for someone who is, I, I want to hold in prayer. So uh, Norma Carr has been in the hospital this week. Um, I haven't talked to Chrissy in a few days to have an update, but um, we want to keep Norma in our thoughts and prayers and also all of the Carr family and, and Jim and Chris and, and everyone who loves Norma dearly. Um, we just pray for, for healing and strength for Norma. Um, and wisdom for the, for the family and the care team that surrounds her uh, to make the appropriate decisions um, for the best way to care for her. So um, if you would all just extend a hand, let's pray over this blanket and then I'll make sure that they get that this week. <sighs> Loving God, we give you thanks for the gift that Norma is to so many people. As she has been a source of strength for so many, may now she be surrounded by strength. We ask that with this blanket goes not only your love, Lord, but all of our love. When Norma is wrapped in it, may she, may she feel that love surround her and fill her. May the warmth of this blanket remind her of the warmth of, of the affection that we all feel for her. And may she be comforted and filled with peace. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all for that. And please do keep Norma and all the cars and Keters in your, in your prayers uh, this week. Are there other joys and concerns that you would lift up this morning? Merle does have a birthday today. Are we ready, Maestro? I missed that, whatever that was. How old are you? <laughs> Care to share with us, Merle? How old are you? 83. Well, congratulations and happy birthday. <laughs> are there other joys and concerns you would lift up this morning? Cassidy, do you have one for us? It is really, really nice out. <laughs> well, I hope you did get a chance to play outside with your sisters these last few days, Miles. It has been a joy to, to have the warmth and the, and the beautiful weather, and I hope everyone had a chance to get outside and enjoy it a little bit. I think spring might be here. <laughs> Are there other joys or concerns this morning? Weaver family? Yeah, I, I did see that. Um, they lost one of the triplets at like three months old. Um, and so we just surround that family with prayer. Um, may God get them through this. 
I was chatting with Heath a little bit this morning, 17 days till Hillary comes home. A joy and a concern, right? It's coming home soon, maybe not soon enough. <laughs> so we uh, continue to pray for Hillary and, and all of those um, training with her. Jan. Give me that name again. Jan Semler had a fall and is in Sioux Falls. So uh, we pray for healing and strength for her as well. So a funeral for Ron's stepdaughter, Ron Blatchford's stepdaughter. It would be Dell's first cousin. So absolutely prayers uh, all around for, for the family. Wow. So for everyone, uh, in case you couldn't hear that, or for those worshiping at home, Janice and Jean last week celebrated um, a seventh great-grandchild being baptized, right? And went back again because number eight is on the way. <laughs> oh, those darn grandkids have to move too far away, don't they? <laughs> Oh, no. Um, okay, give me the relationship again. Your, your grandson's girlfriend's four-year-old child has kidney cancer. Um, so heartbreaking when a little one has to go through a battle like that. So surrounding them in prayer. Yeah, continue. Yeah, Zane Wolf had some surgery this week, so prayers for healing and and uh, for for him and strength for him and Sally both as they continue to to face this challenge. Judy. Prayers for Bob Dodger, who had a, a heart attack this week. Prayers for Bobby's sister, Janie. If there are no others, I would invite you into a time of silent prayer, and then I will guide us through the remainder of our prayer time. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Risen Lord, you came as a sacrifice for our sin. Give us faith to accept this act of love so that we turn from all human efforts and drink in the righteousness of your death and resurrection. You are the true vine and we are the branches. By your spirit, produce the fruit of love, joy, peace, and patience in us for others to taste and enjoy. Keep us from hanging on to love for ourselves. Prune all selfishness from us and fill us with your love. Have mercy on your earth and supply its needs. Where people are hungry, give food. Where people are in distress, comfort them. Where people are in trouble, bring order and peace. And turn the whole world to you in faith in repentance, and in praise. Lord Jesus Christ, focus our love on people we know with particular needs. Heal those who are unwell, particularly those that we have named here today. 
and others in need whom we now name silently in our hearts. Thank you, Lord, for hearing us and caring for us in all of our needs. Constantly intercede for us before our Heavenly Father and open our eyes that we may see him through you. We ask all this in your holy name as we pray together as you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would you stand as we sing our closing hymn, There's a Wideness in God's Mercy, number 121, or on the screen. love one another because love is from God proclaim God's salvation to every generation remain rooted in Jesus Christ and like the branches of a vine draw life from him and may God the vine grower tend you and make you fruitful may Jesus Christ abide in you and give you life and may the Holy Spirit cast out all fear and fill you with God's love Go now in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.